Hi, everybody. Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 196, recorded on April 4th, 2012. I'm Ryan Schraub. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malventano. And uh, I am back at home at the office, no longer traveling. I have to admit, though, uh, I've been gone for so long. I haven't really touched a piece of hardware for any kind of testing purposes in almost two weeks. It feels kind of awkward doing another show like this. Uh, I, kind yeah, of I, I, bet the, I bet the hardware probably have enjoyed uh, the experience of the lack of you touching them all the time inappropriately. I, yeah, the, they don't like the fondling as much as I do. So, you know, but hey, I do it all for the good of everybody else that listens to the show and reads our website. Um, but uh, no, no worries. Josh and Alan have some content they want to talk about. Jeremy's going to bring up some news items for us. Um, I was busy being drunk on Bourbon Street most of the weekend. So uh, I had that going for me. I don't know. Uh, oh, by the way, I need to look up who's going to win our uh, prize for the... Uh, NCAA bracket competition. We'll get to that at the end of the show. Um, and then I'll figure out what I'm going to give them as well. But uh, let's talk about a couple of quick things right away. Uh, first off, Matt Smith posted a review of the new iPad I, slash iPad 3, whatever you want to call it, the not iPad HD. Um, if you are interested in these devices, uh, except for the fact that Volume muting doesn't work the way you think it should. Uh, it's actually a really, really, really nice machine. I took uh, an iPad 3, I'm just going to call it that, with me uh, on our trip to Florida and then to New Orleans. And uh, it was very, very useful. I even found myself taking pictures with the device, which still felt really stupid. Um, but they were good photos, right? It's, it's hard to argue with the quality there. Um, and... Matt went through it, went through all the testing, did some performance testing, did some quality testing, that kind of stuff. It basically came away that this is still the best tablet on the market if you are willing to spend the money. Now, you're still going to have the iOS versus Android debate. Nothing in that realm has changed. Uh, it, it's uh, that the screen on it, the 2048 by 1536 screen on it is just simply amazing. It's, it's beautiful to look at, but I do have to say, uh, when somebody asked me a recommendation, they also had a first gen iPad, which is what I had. And they said, should I get the iPad three or the iPad two, uh, you know, that's now less expensive. And I, you know, I showed them, I had the first gen one and I had the iPad three. And I said, if you look at the screens, you know, not this is somebody who doesn't really follow technology. They don't really know uh, what, you know, what a higher resolution screen is, all that type of thing is. Um, they're like, I said, show me what's, what's different about it. And they have very difficult time seeing the difference in the retina display versus the standard display. And when I pointed it out, I said, well, get real close and look at the text on the, on the icons and that type of stuff. You'll, and they say, oh, yeah, no, I could see the difference there. Uh, but it seemed to be much more subtle than I expected it to be. And uh, in many cases, uh, I, what, did I, what game did I download? Um, Infinity Blade 2 or whatever it is. Pay, I paid actual money for it. By the way, it's an awful game. Don't, don't bother buying it. But I was like, here's a game that they demoed uh, at that new iPad, the iPad 3 announcement. This was going to blow me away in terms of its visuals and that kind of stuff. And it really didn't do anything. It was, I mean, it's Christmas, clear, and it's a good-looking game, but it didn't, it didn't uh, blow me away. Now, Alan, I know you have one of these as well. I don't know if you had any other... Kind of thoughts or comments, real quick. Uh, I just, I just saw the screen. I mean, it's, it, it blew me away as far as its, sharp, its sharpness. Um, but that's just me. That between that and the color, uh, the color gamut, you can tell the reds are like, you know, the reds are much better and the blues are much better. They're just, they're accurate. Um, and the only reason I can really say that is because I use a, I use a Dell monitor that has the H, it's a HC model Dell. So it's the one that had the better backlight that had, you know, the full color gamut, one of those mm -hmm. screens. So every time I use an LCD that's not one of those, everything seems pale to me. Um, and so, so far of the devices I have, the iPad is the only other thing I have in the house that has that same, you know, accurate color. Um, now, I know Ken but, you know, uh, linked us to an application that lets you use the new iPad as like an external display on a PC or Mac, right? Have you tried that out at all? I have not because I thought it was Mac only. Uh, Ken told me there was a Windows option for it as well, and it sounded that sounds really cool to me. Like that's something I could definitely uh, see taking advantage of uh, with with the type of device, especially because you can get that super high resolution. It might be I don't know if it'll make things too small or if it'll actually be interesting to see how you know. I have two 30-inch monitors on my desk. If I set this next to it, do I get any valuable real estate 
uh, in a 10 inch screen at 2048 by 1536. Right. Um, and the Mac, uh, the Mac specific one, I believe uh, there was a, some kind of DPI, a, like monitor specific DPI thing you could mess with on the Mac mm. that would like correct it. And so basically you could say, oh, I'll have double the DPI over there. And, uh, and then it would, you know, I don't know. There were pictures on the, on the post that we were talking about. Did we yeah. cover that or what was it? I was on the verge or something. Yeah. One of those. So uh, Matt, Matt did a, a full review of it. I highly recommend you guys go over to their, uh, go over to our website rather and read the website? article. He co- website. He compares it to the uh, Transformer Prime and a couple of other tablets as well. The original iPad. I'm maybe an iPad 2. I can't remember exactly. Uh, but it performs very well. You know, like I said, I've, I, I used it. Um, I still had, you know, <laughs> My wife and I were out on Tuesday, uh, kind of wandering around uh, downtown New Orleans, and we heard that they were going to have a special presentation, uh, trophy presentation in Lexington with the with the Kentucky Wildcats team. And we're like, oh, okay, we'll just, we'll sit down and eat lunch, and we'll watch it on the iPad. Oh, all three places that were serving it were doing it through Flash Video, and nope. can't do it on an iPad. There's uh, some Flash so- browsers in the store. Yeah, and it's. It, there, there are hacks around it, right? But the, the, the point is, it's, it, it's not the best. I still believe it's not the best user experience without Flash. I, I strongly believe that. So we tried to watch it on my phone, uh, and it was fine, but it was a four-inch screen instead of a two-inch screen. Uh, but it didn't crash my phone, and it worked just fine. So I don't, you know, I don't want to get into that debate. But check out that review if you're interested in uh, looking at the new iPad and how it maybe compares to some of the best Android options out there. The other review we went uh, posted up this week, was from uh, Lee. He actually reviewed a new Silverstone Strider Gold Evolution 1000 watt power supply. Now, it's interesting. uh, Not too long ago, I guess I'll say that 1000 watt power supplies were kind of all the rage. Everybody was talking about them. Uh, Do you have one yet? All these GPUs are going to need it. But we have seen kind of a reversal uh, and things like the GTX 680 using less power than the 580, using less power than the 7970, uh, and, and, and this type of thing, which is good news for users and power consumption and heat issues and all that kind of stuff. But it kind of puts into question now, do you need a 1,000-watt power supply for anything? If you're, even if you're doing GTX 680s and SLI or HD 7970s and Crossfire, I really don't think you need a 1,000-watt power supply anymore. Something in the 750 range will probably be adequate. Uh, still, though... Uh, he came away pretty impressed with this unit. Uh, it's a 80 plus gold rated power supply, as the name indicates. And Silverstone, we've had I've I've personally had a lot of good experiences with Silverstone power supplies over the years. And uh, Lee did give this a gold award as well. Now, now coming up soon, probably sometime later this month, we're going to have Lee come into the studio uh, and do some video with us, uh, comparing a bunch of power supplies, differences between modular, fully modular, non modular. The in, you know tear apart some of the insides and go over uh, what what you're looking for inside one. Whether or not the idea of is a heavier power supply necessarily a better power supply. Those types of things. And maybe even uh, bring some of his testing equipment in, and so he can show us exactly how he goes through the process of testing his power supply. So take a, uh, keep an eye out for that. That should be pretty cool. And we're interested in getting Lee more involved on the video side since he is local here. Yeah, and make now, sure you you have a place to. Uh uh, allow the benchmark monkeys to go to the bathroom. Otherwise, they just throw stuff everywhere. They just throw feces on the wall. Nobody wants. That. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, now we didn't have two drop. <laughs> <laughs> we call it the random splatter effect. Um, Water. Two, two 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 reviews came out today. Actually, one we're going to talk with Alan about. This is uh, this was kind of a surprise to me. I've seen a couple of emails going back between you and the folks at OCZ about it, uh, but I really didn't have any. Uh, thoughts on an upcoming Vertex edition. So they launched the Vertex 4, which is now not using a Sandforce controller. Is that right? Right. So you had a first generation Vertex with IndyLynx. That was before OCZ acquired IndyLynx. So that was like the original IndyLynx. That came out back right around the time when the Intel X25M was big and like SSDs in general were were becoming, um, you know, like a legitimate thing as opposed to something that was... Not very well executed, right? So the Vertex, really good. You know, we were impressed with it uh, for the price, that sort of thing. Uh, even firmware updates. OZZ just like last month released another firmware update for the Vertex 1, believe it or not, that like increased huh. performance. So that's like an end-of-life, like beyond end-of-life drive, and they there's a firmware for it. 
like a new one. Um, so Vertex 2 and 3 were two different stories. OCZ shifted that line to Sandforce controllers. The Vertex 2 was the 3 gigabit SATA. The Vertex 3 was the 6 gigabit SATA version of the Sandforce. But now it's back to IndieLynx. Now it's IndieLynx Everest. Specifically, it's Everest 2. Um, Everest 1 came out in the OCZ Octane, which we looked at a few months back. Um, and this is Everest 2, Electric Boogaloo? Uh, sort of. Um, yeah, so we looked at it, uh, and the sample we got had what is supposed to be the initial shipping firmware, 1.30. Um, it had a little bit of a, of a quirk to it that was discovered throughout the weekend where some reviewers were like, hey, we tried to secure erase it, and it's not securing erasing properly or... It's not, you know, the performance doesn't come back to, like, fresh out of the box condition. So there was a quick bug, bug fix for that. So that's, like, 1.31. So that came out or was pushed out. Um, but when we ran it through all of our tests and when some other reviewers, actually, as I was looking today on at the other reviews out there, whenever you hit the drive with a mixed mode performance, in other words, the drive's doing more than one thing at the same time, right? Like, it's doing some reads with some writes or some, you know, different size things at the same time. Um, it wasn't scaling very well. Uh, the, the, the way that we see that in our, for our testing is the, our IO meter testing, where we have this, this workload that, well, four different workloads, they emulate what you would see in like a workstation or a database server, that, those sorts of different machines, and it just throws those IOs at the drive, and then it sees how well they scale, right? Um, well, with the shipping firmware, the performance wasn't that great. It was sort of flattening out real early. Um, the charts on the website is like this, this red line on the charts is the drive with the shipping firmware and it just sort of levels out like halfway. It's, it's almost like it just hits a brick wall for some reason. And all it really worked out to was it's just firmware tuning, right? This is a new controller. We know how well the OCZ Octane performed, did very well when it was released. It's basically the same controller with some improvements to the hardware, right? So you wouldn't expect it to be, to be lesser when compared to the Octane. Um, so we really knew it was just a firmware kind of issue. And we, we got confirmation on that last night when OCZ passed me a newer firmware and said, hey, this is not going to be what we were release, but take a look at this, see if it fixes anything. Um, that was firmware 1.52. Put that on the drive, it almost turned like night and day. And it, it, it traded off where it was leveling off. It started scaling properly. But... This is that new firmware was not fully tuned. You know, it's not. A, it's just sort of they just pushed it out the door just because there were you know people were starting to raise issue with hey this doesn't look that great. So this one sort of flipped that on on its head, and I said, well, this is different enough where it probably warrants us doing a full round on it and publishing that as well at the same time. So that's what we did. Um, I did the full round testing again as if it was a brand new solid state drive. And we put that on the chart right next to the drive with the, with the previous firmware. And it literally looks like two different solid-state drives when you look at those charts. Um, so what we're hoping is that between those two firmwares, they can pick you know, the good stuff out of either one of those, and they'll end up with a drive that's pretty competitive. Um, but as it was with the initial shipping firmware, uh, sequential reads had some issues. Um, some... Uh, some of the sites were reporting something that's a bit of a misnomer was that there was some kind of weird advanced prefetch going on, like the special new thing that the that this controller was using. Um, when really all it boiled down to was the drive actually performed worse on on some kind of reads if you had not previously written to that area. So like where usually a solid state drive, if you read from it when it's fresh out of the box and you just start running benchmarks on it and you're hitting areas of the drive that you've never touched before, usually they, they go really, really fast because they don't have to do any work. They're like, well, he wants this data, but there's nothing there. And so I, I never wrote to that. So it just like returns zeros and it does it really quick. Um, this drive, it was doing the opposite. It wasn't really performing that great for that stuff, but it's not hmm. realistic at all because who's going to try to read from areas that you've never written to, right? Um, so what it boiled down True. to was... You, you need to precondition the drive when you're doing testing. So we always precondition the drive. We always write to the, all of the area on the drive first before we do anything. Um, so we didn't see any of the supposed, uh, you know, the, 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 the way we kept hearing about it was that it was, oh, it does better if it's, there's a partition on the drive. Well, the reason it does better when there's a partition on the uh. drive is because, because those benchmarks have to write a test file first and before then they benchmark can do any on the test file. Yes. Gotcha. Um, so really, it wasn't 
at the end of the day, it had nothing to do if there was a partition there. It just had to do with you could run those benchmarks that did not re require a partition as long as you had previously written across the entire surface of the drive and all those areas were touched at least once. Um, interesting. Uh, but, uh, and another interesting point from that was that uh, usually solid-state drives tend to slow down once you have quote-unquote filled them all the way up, right? Once you've touched all area on, on the drive, right? Right. Um, whereas this drive, that was sort of the opposite, right? It, it didn't perform as well if you hadn't touched that area before, but if you wrote to every square inch of the drive and you had, you know, filled it to capacity, um, it still performed, you know, we're talking, we're talking half a terabyte drive. So that's an awful lot of flash memory to, to start slinging around and tracking what got stored where. And this was doing that really well, right? This was, you know, with the newer firmware, let me qualify that. Um, so more to follow on this. Uh, my, my take on it initially was that it just didn't feel like it was done. Um, but I could tell from some of the numbers I was seeing that the hardware was really, it had a very high capability. It, you know, it's, it has a, an ability to be a very, very good, fast solid state drive. It could probably even beat, you know, from, from what I saw, I think with the proper firmware tuning, it has the capability of beating even the 830 or at least matching it, the Samsung 830, um, which as of right now is still sort of my favorite pick um, because even with this, even with the newer firmware for the testing I did, the Samsung 830 was still beating it out. So it is what it is. We hope uh, to see a new is firmware this, uh, within like this, two to three weeks. I, I kind of I kind of see this as a not great trend in SSDs where data storage is something that's so crucial to so many people that the idea of constantly updating firmwares on an SSD is very unappealing to me. Um, you know, if I have to update the driver on my graphics card, that's one thing. But if I need to update the firmware on my solid state drive where all my data is stored, and maybe, you know, you're one of the people that's smart enough and you have external backups, but then you have to get the firmware and maybe you lose all of your programs, you have to reinstall Windows, you have to reinstall all of your applications, all this other kind of stuff. It's, we're getting to a point where I almost feel like that's not acceptable, right? We listed as a pro in the review that OCZ is, you know, post-release performance upgrades via firmware support. But how often are these destructive versus, uh, you know, like kind of passive updates and that kind of stuff? And is it something that, that end users really want to kind of have to fool with is updating software on their SSD? It's like, you know, it's not something we've ever really done on hard drives and it's you know, maybe people aren't used to that, and I'm not used to the idea of that. It just seems, it seems very unappealing to me to have to worry about that kind of stuff on a storage drive. Right, and uh, I'm inclined to agree with you, personally. Um, but I will say that the Vertex line, specifically, and just OCZ sort of in general, uh, they've always tended towards this enthusiast sort of thing, right? They're, they're guys that are, you know, when, when SSDs first started becoming popular, there were huge forum threads on OCZ forums talking about, okay, which... But if you align the partition like this and it gets you this, you know, two, three percent better performance for this kind of thing. And I mean, these guys are constantly tweaking. It's just that kind of community. Um, so in that respect, when you get those drives, especially the consumer grade ones, it's, it's sort of just par for the course. Right. There's always firmwares and there's always they're always trying to eke more performance out of it. Um, and it, it just really depends on which way you want to go with it, right? Intel sat on that 520 series, their Sandforce drive. They sat on that for over a year, right? Doing performance optimizations and everything else, right? Same kind of deal with if Intel was making, with the way that their, their mantra works, if they were to make a uh, Indy Lynx, you know, one of these drives, it probably wouldn't come out till next year, right? Because they just... They want to make the firmware. They want to do all the performance optimizations. They want to do all this insane amount of, you know, qualification and everything behind the scenes, right? So what it looks like OCC did here was they made this particular firmware, they made it stable, right? That 1.30 firmware, it's regardless of what kind of workload I was given the drive and no kind of, no compatibility issues, no, you know, the drive worked. It didn't drop out. It didn't do anything weird that would cause uh, any of those blue screen of death issues with, uh, Indie Links or not Indie Links with the uh, Sandforce when they had you know their firmware growing pains and whatnot. So I think they focused on that first, 
and then their intention okay. is, you know, down the road to then squeeze the performance out of it and make it go really, really fast. They did optimize for some things initially with the initial shipping firmware, but that's stuff that w that we tend to not focus on. Like we don't just take a solid state drive and do nothing but 4K random writes just to see mm -hmm. what it does. Now that's a number that you'll see as a spec list for drives. And you would think, well, why wouldn't you want to test that? Well, because when the drive is in your computer, your computer doesn't do nothing but 4K random writes. That just, you know, that, that's just not, re it's not realistic, right? You're sure. just not going to do that to a drive. Um, what you are going to do is you're going to, you know, be streaming media while you're doing some small writes in the background, and that kind of stuff. That's what the IO meter testing points out for us. So that's why we stick with that. Um, but yeah, uh, Vertex just in general is, is, you know, that they, I think... With the, with the potential I see in this controller, I think I, I prefer that for this particular line and just that, that you have to have that understanding that they're going to improve on down the road like they usually do with these, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of better to be able to get it in your hands sooner than later, right? Okay. As opposed to, you know, I, I would rather have, if I was looking, if I was an enthusiast kind of person um, and I knew what this drive, what this pedigree sort of meant, I would probably get this knowing, okay, you know, it's good cost per gig you know it's it's yeah the pricing the other is ones. reasonable yeah yeah the pricing is very reasonable um and yeah it's not performing that great right now but we know what chip is in there we know what it's capable of they'll probably be you know firmware down the road um you know i i, I wish it would have been a little bit better out of the gate um but just looking at that other firmware you, okay. know, you can tell they're they're already halfway there with so the is this something we will is this something we will revisit, rediscuss type of thing? Is there another article you're already planning around the Vertex 4? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the number I've gotten is two to three weeks out from now on when the next like shipping or the next one that will actually be pushed out to owners of the drive through the, through the OCC toolbox software. Um, okay. And when that happens, as soon as it does, then if the performance takes another jump, um, basically any kind of decent improvement on top of what we saw with 1.52, then we'll revisit it again and probably list all three of them side by side. You know, here's 1.30, here's 1.52, here's whatever the new one is. And this will be one of those few cases where we tell people to update their firmware for reasons other than, you know, this might be a bug kind of right. thing. It's like, hey, you should update because your drive will go twice as fast. <laughs> that sort of thing. That's, that, that would be substantial. Um, well, there's another nice point about this drive too. Five-year warranty. That's yes. a big change for OCZ. That's another big deal. Um, Five-year warranty, so they're matching the Intel 520 series, which were the only other guys doing that. Um, and that, that, is, that is a big deal. Now, I, I would have said that um, the Intel thing is sort of a wash because they cost so much. But if you recall, the MSRPs were really high when the 520 came out, the Intel. Um, but when I did the research, when actually the last page of this piece right here, um, the 520 prices have come down, like the actual street prices. So they're very competitive with everybody else. So really, it's you have Samsung, which performs really well, but it has a three-year warranty, which, in my opinion, is still a pretty long warranty for a drive. Three years. No, right? not long enough. Right? I don't know. It's pretty good. If it hasn't how failed... How long is... Uh, the how old is know, this thing, uh, you know... Say, well, I'm being Al Jr., Look at my uh -oh. stack of SSDs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm growing. That's cute. But you know the original Sam uh, sunk 256 meg that you had sent me. When, okay. when how old is yeah. that thing? That's 2009. Like, uh, yeah. Well, no, wow. it's, it's probably 2010. No, it says zero nine eleven. Oh, so I'm guessing November. There you go. But look at my bag of SSDs. Yeah, I know, right? Those drives were really good. Um, those were the ones that were instantly in all the OEMs everywhere. Um, You're right. When they, when they came out. Um, that was back before Samsung or Samsung did not have a retail channel of their own. So they were, you know, you can only get them on like eBay and stuff like that. <laughs> all right. So uh, well, more, more on the Vertex 4 soon. Uh, are these for sale today already or are they coming they are soon? They are supposed to be for sale. Okay. If they are not, well, they might probably be there by the time you listen to this podcast. All right.
Uh, we have another article we're going to talk about. This one is with Josh. He, something Me. I think we've probably alluded to several times. Uh, a review twice. of the AMD FX 6200 processor, which is a bulldozer part. We haven't really talked much about bulldozer since its kind of initial release. And uh, maybe there's a reason for that. Uh, Josh, why don't you kind of, what, what, what's, what are kind of the base specs of a 6200? How, how's it different from the 8000 series that we talked about um, in ad nauseum months ago? Yeah, back in October is when the first bulldozers were released, and uh, we really only saw reviews on the top end part, the 8150. That is the fully functional bulldozer module, uh, well, bulldozer CPU. It's comprised of four modules. Each one of those modules has two integer execution units and uh, one kind of shared floating point uh, MMX SSE AVX unit that is 2 by 128 bits in, in width. Um, that was running at 3.6 gigahertz. Uh, you know, when, when these first came out, a lot of people were talking about the FX 6100, which was... Uh, you know, the bulldozer part with one module uh, disabled. So it essentially had three modules, six cores. And a lot of people were looking at this as it could be, you know, really the new budget enthusiast uh, uh, fun and games type overclocking, still have good performance. But AMD never really put those out. And they were, you know, I think, I believe they were clocked to either 3.1 or 3.3 gigahertz. I think it was 3.1. And, uh, they essentially were slow, and people who tried it were very unhappy with it. I mean, they certainly could overclock a bit, and that improved things, you know, fairly dramatically. Uh, but it was not what people were really looking for. So, fast forward to the end of January, I believe. AMD announced the FX6200 and the FX4170, which were refreshes of the bulldozer cores. Um... The FX6200, which I covered today, has raised its uh, its clock, its base clock speed to 3.8 gigahertz. It has a turbo core up to 4.1 gigahertz. And so a lot of people were thinking, hey, you know, we're finally getting to the point where uh, this product will, will really kind of be able to stretch its legs. It, it's going to fulfill the promise of enthusiasts everywhere. It's only $10 more expensive than the 6100. And uh, so we badgered AMD for a while about getting one of these chips in, and, and they just refused. They didn't want to. Yep. We kept getting the runaround. And so finally, I was able to, on my own, get a hold of, uh, of an FX6200. And I thought, well, you know, this is a lot of people have been really pushing to have a review, at least a lot of readers. I know that I've been pinged a couple of times, you know, hey, when when are we going to see results of this? Uh, I've seen a lot of forum uh, postings. You know, have you seen any good reviews of the FX6200? And the reason why is it uh, it it just doesn't meet expectations. Um, first of all, the, the 6100 was a 95 watt TDP part. And when we thought the FX6200 was coming out, we thought, hey, you know, this would be a minor revision uh, of the bulldozer cores. Uh, they, they, they're going to have improvements with the 32 nanometer process. They're going to have improvements with the design. But now it's, it's now 125 watt TDP, just the same as the 8150. And even though it runs, you know, Ow. faster, it's still got a core disabled, uh, well, a module disabled. And the performance is really, really, really crazy. Sometimes it performs really, really well. You add more threads, and suddenly performance just really, really drops. It's you, You're going to really have to read the review and see the results because it's, it's kind of Jekyll and Hyde-ish in, in how it does. You, you first think, hey, you know, single thread, it, it stays competitive with the uh, Phenom 2 X6-1100T. We add a second and third thread, and suddenly performance just, you know, absolutely dies out. It drops well below what the 1100T is able to do. And that's, you know, very concerning for people who want a well-performing, you know, consistent processor. And especially one that's on a new process node. It's a new architecture. It's got new technology. And the previous 45 nanometer parts just kind of spank it around. I compared it against the 1100T and the X4980, which is their fastest quad core that they had released up until this point. 
uh, which was 3.7 gigahertz. And in a lot of tests, the 980 still beats out on the uh, the FX6200. It's It was really yeah. disappointing. It was kind of eye-opening how mediocre it really performed. And the only time that it really ever started to do better was when I overclocked it to 4.5 gigahertz. At that point, it finally overcame in pretty much every benchmark except a couple the 1100T. <laughs> and you think, hey, we've, we've got a 4.5 gigahertz processor here. Why isn't it just smoking the previous generation that runs at 3.3 gigahertz? And it just, it just doesn't. It's and not only that, but when we take a look at the power consumption... Yeah, um, that's what I was laughing at, actually, as I s yeah. came across that graph. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the FX6200 at stock speed, uh, at idle, it's actually doing really, really well. Once you put it to load, it's 12 watts uh, more power hungry than the 1100T. But when you actually overclock it to 4.5 gigahertz where it's actually competitive to the 1100T, it's pulling down 104 more watts at the plug. This is just insane. I mean, it... 104 additional watts 124 on a 125-watt TDP watts. part. Yeah, yeah. I, go figure. So this is, uh, this is like the polar opposite in CPU form of a GTX 680. Pretty much. You know, if, if we kind of look <laughs> back and see at history, this really is very similar to the Intel Pentium 4 Northwood versus the Intel Pentium 4 Prescott. And you know all the jokes about Prescott and Press Hot. This is almost exactly the same thing. They've, they've doubled the dice, uh, well, the transistor count essentially, and they've achieved no real impro uh, performance improvements over the previous generation, which was, you know, a pretty good part. Northwood was was good. Prescott was, well, it, it, it kind of caused in, Intel's downfall at, at that time, and, and it really allowed the rise of AMD with the Athlon 64. So we're kind of seeing almost a, a mirrored effect of, of that with, with AMD right now. VFX is just, it's just, not a very good architecture right now. It's not. It's not. And no. one of the things I found in our in in my initial performance testing, and one of the things I thought was going to be fixed when Microsoft and AMD supposedly released that patch, right? That the, you know, what, some of the results I'm looking at in here, some of the results I saw is when you go from one thread to two, comparing it on the FX6200 to the 1100T or whatever, or the, even the X4980. Uh, performance would drop significantly compared to those processors because, you know, it was scheduling both threads on this on two different cores according to Windows, but it's on the same module which share a lot of uh, computing uh, operations. So, you know, if they could separate them by modules, we would think we would see drastic improvements in like the one, two, three, and four threaded um, uh, process uh, or applications rather. But it still didn't really fix anything. You know, even you know they were, you know, when AMD is saying, yeah, we're talking maybe two to three percent performance difference uh, when we get this type of patching involved. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, you know, over like, that, I, I did do the, the, the Microsoft patches where, you know, it, it handles the, the, the core parking and the, the, uh, the thread scheduling so that, uh, you know, threads that actually have a lot of dependencies can be sent to the same module where it can, they can share the same L2 caches while those with less dependencies can, can have a little bit more throughput by going to a separate module. I, you know, I'd installed all that stuff. I'd updated the, the system to be able to handle that. And, you know, it just, nothing would really get this thing going. Now, the the only real positive that I saw was uh, when I did the Skyrim test. Now Skyrim is is very CPU dependent, and even though it's only a DirectX nine uh, title, you know it, it still chugs on the CPU. It it needs you know pretty good fast single thread multi thread performance, and a pretty good gaming CPU to have um, you know a good performance out of. Now at at the regular speeds it did pretty bad, but once I actually overclocked it, it was you know probably the best performer out of the entire group mm. and we kind of look at that and say well sure it's overclocked but we also see that uh, it's got a ton more l2 and l3 cache than those other products combined and that is one thing that games really really enjoy is a lot of cash so if you don't care about being power hungry to the hundred to a tune of 104 plus watts 
um, then this you know could be a pretty decent gaming processor if you were just kind of going to do that. But everything else, it, it really just fell behind the 1100T, which is you know a native uh, six core. It doesn't have any kind of uh, shared decoding abilities that uh, Bulldozer has. Um, you know, it's it's a beefier uh, floating point and MMX unit. Even though Bulldozer has the AVX capabilities, uh, the mass, vast majority of software out there just can't can't really leverage the advantages that this architecture has. And so, in the end, you know, we, we really got to wonder: is is Trinity and uh, Vachera, which are both based on the pile driver cores, are they going to be able to overcome a lot of these issues? And uh, really have a well-performing part. Well, after you know, kind of digging around with this one, I don't think we're going to see any miracles with with Trinity. I think we're going to see improvements, and certainly it will be more competitive. And in terms of of graphics capability, it will be a step above everything else in in, in the industry. But in CPU performance, I, I don't think we're going to see the kind of jump that a lot of people were hoping for. I think they're going to improve things like, you know, the L1D cache is going to be bigger. Uh, I think they're going to really work on a lot of the latencies to the caches. I think they're going to work on the front end, um, namely, you know, the the uh, the instruction decoder, the four-wide decoder to send stuff to the execution units. But I'm not expecting any kind of miracles whatsoever with Trinity. Yep. And so that's a little disappointing. Mm-hmm. Well, we will know more about Trinity, uh, I think, fairly soon, actually. So uh, we will update you guys from there. But, um, yeah, that, that's disappointing. I was hoping that we would have more of an ability to kind of recommend people to try these kind of lower-cost AMD bulldozer solutions, but uh, maybe not. And with Ivy Bridge coming out sooner rather than later, there's going to be more problems, really, for AMD on the CPU side. Uh, let's take a quick maybe break here. stop firing people. Uh, or people should stop leaving, one or the other. Yeah, or that. You call it firing, you can call it resignations. Uh, there no there is a difference, but there's, yeah, either way. Uh, we'll take a quick break here. Thank today's uh, podcast sponsor. And then uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit about news. All righty, thank you for that. Um, not a whole lot of major news Uh, This week, surprisingly, I think all of the leaks, about 680, those are all gone now the product is out. The leaks for Ivy Bridge are basically repeating themselves, so don't necessarily have to talk about that to any um, great degree. But um, let's see, there are a couple of interesting things. This was, uh, and I thought it was kind of funny, Scott posted a news story about uh, Adobe Flash Player apparently... um, having an advertisement on it that urges you to purchase system checkup by dra- dramatizing mundane events on your PC to be remedied only by their paid product. Uh, it seems that we have come full circle now where the, the actual viruses that you get that they encourage you to buy uh, system software, software to fix it all, are now being offered by Adobe as well. Did anybody actually see this in use? I never actually came across it. So he has a screenshot here on the, on the page, though. No, I hadn't seen I, it. I just re- Go ahead, Al. I hadn't seen it in the wild floating around, but I saw the auto update choice uh for the new Flash where it will automatically install updates for you. Which reading this story makes it a little bit scary because are they gonna automatically optimize your computer at the same bloody time? <laughs> it could happen. Uh on the other hand, I mean Adobe is desperate to sell air. And I'm betting that that runs on an air interface, that software. Uh, another news story actually posted by Scott is something about uh, ZDNet and other, art, uh, other outlets publishing articles discussing the rising prices of PCs. Jeremy, did you read over this news post or any of the, the source content here? Oh, yeah, I believe the uh, sky is falling um, yet Again, right. uh, it, we're in the post-PC world. Uh, PC gaming is dying, so on, so forth. Um, essentially, they're sort of talking about the idea that, oh, hard drives have gotten really, really expensive lately. Yes, there is a temporary blip in the market, but, you know, Apple's got this huge advantage because they, they have SSDs in their models now, unlike the Ultrabook or anything else currently on the market from the PC side. <laughs> uh Oh, but LCD panels are, are going to get a little bit more expensive because, um, you know, Windows 8 is coming out and it's, it's going to have a touchscreen, so a lot of people are going to buy them. 
Wait, wait. So, oh, so, so demand gonna is going to make... Yeah, because nobody does now. But okay, <laughs> no, even touch screen no. panels. Suddenly demand goes up and, well, price is supposed to fall, isn't it? Isn't that the economic theory, you know? No, no, prices go up. Get used to it. And of oh, course, okay. the last thing is um, DRAM. My God, it's it's gone up 7% this year. 7%. That, that 15 or $20 that you're going to spend on the RAM on your system... Unless you want to go, you know, insane <laughs> and, and spend fifty dollars, you, you're going to end up spending an extra two or three dollars. My That's God, it. It, it's bank breaking. Second like How, However, you're going to do this. I, I'm sure you take this with the amount of uh, seriousness that I do, Al. Mm, pretty much. Talking like a five dollar difference. Come on. Yeah. What the? Yeah. So yeah, I, I think sorry. I think of all the things. I, Prices are still going to continue to come down on the uh, on the items that need to continue to come down. I'm still uh, eagerly awaiting the five hundred dollar twenty seven inch twenty five sixty by fourteen forty display, promised to me sometime in twenty twelve. Um, so I'm going to hold whoever told me that uh, to their to their prediction. And if it doesn't happen, I'm just going to make them buy me a bunch of panels and then sell them to me for five hundred bucks a piece. Uh, you know, something that I think we did take seriously is, uh, Jeremy, you posted perhaps the most disgusting computer mod I've ever seen. Uh, and this was done on purpose. <laughs> this is toilet water PC cooling. And not just toilet water, but like the nastiest supposedly clean toilet water I've ever seen. You, uh, you want to know why, oh, that's know why it looks so nasty? I figured out why it looks so nasty. Why? So this guy's got hoses poked through the wall because there's a toilet, con I guess the quote from the piece is conveniently located on the opposite end of where his <laughs> PC, which is actually just parts just sort of, I don't know, double-sided taped to the wall or something. On the other, <laughs> no, to know, a handmade penguin. And don't look at ah, those yes, pictures because yes. he's not wearing a shirt. Handmade penguin that's just, there's just a motherboard and stuff just hanging off of this thing. But he's, so he's got... Lines running, poking Oops. through the wall and then going into behind, you know, under the toilet lid and into the toilet water. And um, so even lists like some temperatures that the water is running at, that my toilet, like my toilet water is running at this many degrees. And it's that. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, if you heat up water that's stagnant already and you don't put like some kind of chlorine something in there, which he probably is not doing because then it would mess up the water box and other what things. about 10,000 uh, flushes? I don't know. He needs to do <laughs> something because otherwise you're going to grow this nice, like he's making penicillin in bulk in his toilet. No, he's not. Mm. Because he's you know, how many times do you go in and flush your toilet a day? Yeah. I mean, unless you live in, you know, stinking Versailles, Josh, which has 700 toilets inside? in it. Look at the picture. It's like the whole it's hard toilet water toilet. stains. Black. Okay, yeah, no, it's hard water stains. Probably an old, it's an old toilet. Yeah. Who cares? Uh, I mean, it looks oh, nasty, just... but if you've never lived in a place that has hard water, you you don't understand the mineral deposits that will just pile up on your. Bathtub. I agree with the thousand flushes comment though, but hey, I think it, it's... pumping some blue water through that stuff would be really cool and probably yeah. ruin your hardware, but. Well, why? It needs I mean, the, it can't be worse than a lot of the cooling fluids That's that are used. That's true. Yeah. But the thing is, he totally screwed up. He could have made this so much better. A oh. little, a slight changing on the tubing, he would never have to sit down on a cold toilet seat again. Ah, true. <laughs> That'd have been pretty funny. I, I actually might have looked into that uh, modification then. Well, you get the benefits of a warm toilet seat without the expensive price of a Japanese toilet. So I saw the Great coolest, like, it was, I guess it was a Japanese toilet. It was, like, the coolest idea. It was just that you replace the toilet lid with this other thing, and the water that usually goes to refill the toilet first goes through this little sink that's built into the lid. So you, you flush your toilet, and then you have and yet, a little water I thought thing. they were building penicillin in the system. There's no, no, no. This was this. The top part was yeah. clean. It was just like a sink, right? <laughs> you just so, so then you're using salt, gray right? water. Then to you're, flush. Washing your, you're washing yeah. your hands right there yeah. at the little sink thing as it's refilling the bin for the, the you know, the toilet thing. It's like awesome. with really stinking cold water. Yes. Oh, probably. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, what else do we have? There's news here of NVIDIA urging us to program better now, not later, according to Intel. Did anybody read this this story? Uh, this this something that it came to me. I saw several tweets about it and posts about it, uh, about apparently a new push for Intel's MIC, which is the mini integrated core architecture. Again, going back to the whole idea of using lots of tiny x86 cores to do graphics processing as opposed to the GPUs that are very different architecturally that you see from NVIDIA and AMD and the Radeon and GeForce series. Josh, did you did you read this? What were they talking about here? I know NVIDIA posted a blog about it, just kind of maybe pointing out some of the fallacies in Intel's argument on the MIC side. Yeah, I actually did read this the day it came out, and uh, he makes a lot of good points. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Intel is saying with the MIC is that, hey, it's x86-based. You don't have to change anything around to get your programs to run on our on our MIC, MIC and you're going to see performance at the yin yang, yin yang. But yin -yang. Um, no, that's that's not exactly the case because you know how many programs do we have that are still really single thread optimized, and uh, whether you run it on uh, you know the highest end uh, i7 or the MIC, it's not going to utilize any kind of parallelism that uh, that is involved in there. And so the guy brings up a lot of really good points is that you've got to, one, really evangelize to the, uh, to the programmers that they have to expand their software out to, to really take advantage of, you know, the computational uh, parallelism that is involved in not just MIC, but uh, in, in uh, NVIDIA's, you know, CUDA based architectures. And, uh, you know, they, they basically went step by step and kind of said that, hey, you know, what Intel is currently evangelizing is, is really not true because um, still their performance per watt for these, you know, MICs is not as good as, as more uh, focused technologies from AMD and NVIDIA with their graphics for a lot of these workloads. And, uh, you know, part of that is because essentially Intel took a very basic Pentium processor, you know, slapped on 64-bit with it. And, I mean, we're talking the original Pentium back in 1989, 90. Can't remember exactly when that was um, first delivered in its totally not exactly functional form at 60 megahertz. But anyway, uh, they take the basic design, they add vector units to it, you know, slap a bunch of them on a piece of silicon with a, you know, pretty decent uh, uh, network topology to share data, and uh, it's it's going to take a lot more than just saying, hey, this is an x86, you can port stuff over so incredibly easy, and that's just not the case. I mean, the work needs to start at ground level. Yep. Um, you know, NVIDIA obviously offers its, you know, its, its uh, you know, what, C plus for graphics or, you know, CUDA and all, all that kind of stuff, and say, hey, you need to build from this if you really want highly parallelized stuff not paralyzed as in, you know, can't move, but, but, but parallelized. <laughs> <laughs> Those very different things. Yes. It, it is. Paralyzed, it is. So we and, do want uh, paralyzed. The sized. Mm. But anyway, so, uh, I, yeah, I mean, he also it, goes, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, okay, I'll go. Um, he also you says, go. you know, there are certain workloads that are more appropriate for a serial based type CPU, which AMD and, and Intel has. And you really need to take a good look at those and be able to break off the work that is, you know, something that'll, that'll be more appropriate for some heavy number crunching in, in a more parallel type scheme. And so, you know, this guy was being pretty, uh, pretty even handed with how he said that a lot of these HPC workloads are coming is that these hybrid architectures with a strong serial type CPU combined with a very strong, you know, a parallel, highly parallel uh, architecture, you know, has a lot of really good things going for it. And the way Intel is kind of talking about, hey, you plug in a Knight's Corner and uh, you're instantly going to get all this extra performance because, hey, it's x86 base. It's just not true. I mean, you have to start way low level and work from there. And, uh, you know, the stuff that you're going to learn is, you know, it's going to write a whole new textbook. Uh, yep. Just because we're Literally. we're still in the very beginnings of of these kind of architectures, and it's you know it's it's cutting edge stuff, and the pitfalls are are certainly there. And that was kind of one thing that I'm, I was really impressed with is is they mentioned a lot of them. They mentioned the issues that 
they're going to have and that you know their their architecture is not perfect because they don't have you know a, a very you know high performance serial cpu at their disposal for nvidia but you know they're trying to leverage their strengths in the gpu market uh but they just kind of wanted to clear some of the, the clouds about why what Intel was saying with their MIC was not exactly correct. And, you know, you need to dig a little deeper. All right, let's move on. Well, Our last... Do you not think that... Oh, okay. go ahead, Jeremy. Well, no, no, go ahead. I was go just going to say, do you not think that this sort of expands into a... And there's a phone ring behind me, of course, because, you know, the podcast is going on. But uh, do you not think they're expanding Intel this to pissed. a more... Uh, yeah, probably. Or Pelly. Uh a more supercomputer type uh, environment. You've got NVIDIA desperately trying to get into HPC, providing, you know, parallelized programming on something that AMD and Intel have both made recent purchases, uh, looking at uh, infrastructure using the PCI Express bus to be able to string together gobs and gobs and gobs of CPUs which, in theory, are also going to be running an architecture which is, might just take advantage of uh, Fermi or Kepler uh, cards for HPC. So is this not also sort of an idea that, look, you guys really have to start programming for systems that have significant amounts of CPUs. Not four, not six, not eight. 64, 128. You, you've got to start doing this because otherwise our HPC cards are not going to be that impressive. Yeah, I agree. Now, and, and this goes back into the discussions we've had over the years, even talking about... Uh, the uh, the ability to do ray tracing versus rasterization, it, it's, it's all you know. You have, to, you have to be able to program for it, and then you have to be able to you know uh, have the bulk processing power in this form that you currently do get with with standard GPUs. So, uh, last bit of news for the day, Alan. You want to talk about this? OCZ isn't the only one with a new drive today, as Jeremy posts. Hitachi is now offering a four terabyte UltraStar hard drive. Now, th realize this is not their first 4 terabyte drive. There's been a desk star model floating around. That's like the consumer grade. So the Ultra Star is like their, if you compare it in Western digital terms, like their RE4 style drive, you know, the okay. enterprise class drive. Um, so and, and I'm really sort of torn on this because I think even their, their desk star model is also 7,200 RPM. When you put eight platters in a drive and you spin them at 7,200 RPM, they don't, they get hot. <laughs> they, get <laughs> they get warm. They get warm. I mean, the drive will run cool if it has good airflow. So for an enterprise class drive, that's not the, that big of a deal. You know, you're going to have it installed in some form of a rack. They're going to have really good fans. They're going to make a lot of fan noise mm -hmm. and all that stuff you hear in a server room. But just the fact that that same thing exists on the consumer side from them, I don't know how, you know, you better put that thing in a very well ventilated case. Um, but yeah, it's good to see that they're stepping into this because uh, the reason I want to see them move into that is because I want to see 4 terabyte propagate out a little more. Because all we have so far is uh, Seagate and Hitachi mm -hmm. for 4 terabytes. That's all that's out there. Um, now, is that, really you people, you, do you think people aren't eager to adopt it because of the heat issues that you're referring to and the fact that they have to use 8 platters to do it? Uh, 8 platters. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, not so much. Uh, but when Seagate moved to their three terabyte drive, remember we saw oddball issues with that, right? It was in this sort of enclosed external uh, GoFlex enclosure thing, and the drive itself was wrapped in like an aluminum, you know, thing, and inside of that, and it was just it was just starving for for heat transfer. It was like I'm overheating like crazy, um, and it was to the point where the drive would slow down to like 10 megabytes per second write speed or some you know ridiculously <laughs> slow thing like that. It would never fail. But it would obviously be self-limiting just on purpose. Um, so I don't think, I haven't heard any reports of this drive doing that. Um, but just my take is you should always have like a 5400 RPM version when you start throwing that much density in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 the, the density is good enough. You're getting good sequential transfer rates, even spinning slower. You know, it's still going to be a fast drive. Um, and but for an enterprise longer. drive, you know, for an enterprise drive, I can see 7200. Um, but yeah, I just, I just want to see more models. I think that's really what it's going to take. There just needs to be a few more models out there just to get the word out. I don't, I think a lot of people still don't know that there are four terabyte drives, that they exist. Right. Wait, uh, yeah. there are four um, terabyte drives? Yeah. You can buy wow. them, Josh. You can has them. 
They are on the market. Uh, they they it, they sort of, you know, they started to get popular ish, and then the whole tsunami thing happened, and then you know the prices uh, were already I, high per gig anyway, and then it just sort of fell flooding, off the radar. Flooding, tsunami, it's all water. Cats and dogs makes, living yep. together, you know, yeah, mass hysteria, yeah. Um, so hopefully with the price coming back down and this model introduction and. I haven't heard anything from anybody, but I'm hoping that, you know, Western Digital, the other guys, they'll come out with whatever their, you know, respective four terabyte models are from their, for their lines. I mean, it really, it has to happen soon, right? It really does. Really Western does. Digital, really. I, right, Western Digital, I think, is overdue for, I don't even think they have an enterprise class three terabyte model, now that I think about it. I think they're overdue to play catch up. But they're probably just playing it safe. They're selling, you know, they're they're making drives that they can with what they've got right now with the with the market. They're probably just looking at their their market, you know, specs and realizing, well, we sell an awful lot more one and two terabyte drives than we sell three. So why even bother making four, right? You know, sometimes you just don't need to be the market leader on capacity necessarily when nobody's buying that higher capacity. Um, all right. So let's, uh, Alan, what do you have coming up this week? Do you have any uh, plans for other articles that uh, we can expect to t discuss on next week's podcast or people can check out as they should at uh, PCPair.com before then? The goal for the comings up that I can talk about is I'm going to try to get a piece up on that IOSafe, that like semi-indestructible hard drive in a box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely want to see that. On, yeah. Um, I mean, it works great, but there's not, you know, it's just a hard drive in a box. So this... There's only and there's a limit to you know I'm not willing to burn down my house um, to do that. No, but could you take it to the base and what if we flipped a car on it and then caught the car on fire? Uh, I mean, we could we could do that stuff, but we should you know you know couches are cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll just stick it in Ryan's couch, which we, the chat room said that was on fire earlier. So um, we're gonna flip it. Yeah, we're gonna catch it on fire. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then. Um, there's that, and then there's uh, some other stuff that I can't talk about. Okay. Uh, Josh, what about you? Do you have any interesting articles you have planned for this week? Well, yeah, I, I kind of do. Um, just for grins, I'm, I'm, you know, a couple of months back last summer, I, I did, a, you know, setting up a Crossfire article for the first time. And, and, and you know, I'm going to give a shot with this whole, you know, enclosed water cooling thing. So I'm, I'm taking a look at the Antec... Uh, a to the cooler H two O six twenty, put that in my main machine. You know, figure out how well it works. If it's actually quieter. If it's actually cooler. <laughs> no pun intended. Anyway, and uh, you know, I, I want to take a look at this and see if it's as good as I hear that people really seem to like these kind of solutions rather than the pure air cooling that uh, we all have on our CPU. So that should be up next week. I'm glad to see them move it into that area because they. I, I'm partial to their cases. I like their cases, so it's nice to see that you can also get the the cooler from them as well. Cooler, yeah. <laughs> cool. It's a cooler. cooler. Uh, this week you should see stuff from me on. It's wow. It's taking ten days off was bad timing for me here. Um, we did GTX 680 SLI testing and uh, benchmarking. We need to do, finish the write-up on that. We're going to do surround performance testing as well with 680s uh, in SLI and single 680s and compare that to the HD 7970s. Uh, we have Z77 motherboards to discuss and to do videos of and to do reviews of. We can, we're we're going to be able to do testing with uh, Sandy Bridge processors very soon. And uh, we have a main gear shift system that has been sitting here for a little bit longer than it should have. Uh, that we're looking forward to uh, doing a review on this week as well. So, lots to Friday do. I get Friday and Monday off, so screw you guys. Canadians. <laughs> no, 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 screw you, Canadian. <laughs> uh, let's do our hardware software picks of the week so that we can all get off the podcast and get back to doing the reviews that we need to do. Um, I am, surprisingly, I looked before the show, and we did not have any of these wonderful cards in stock anywhere. This is the Galaxy GTX 680, uh, the box, I guess. It's not really the card. Uh, I was going to recommend the 680 this week because we really couldn't recommend it last week because it wasn't in stock, And uh, as it turns out. It's still not in stock. So, But what I did find 
was that uh, despite not having official verification from AMD about it or them kind of wanting to discuss it, is that the HD 7970 prices have been slowly coming down, at least on a couple of models. Um, we actually, if you go to Newegg, if you go to that link on Newegg, you'll see you can find them for as low as $529 now, which is, you know, 20 bucks less, 20, 30 bucks less than they were a couple of weeks ago. Um, which is which is interesting, right? So the Gigabyte has a model for 529. HIS has a model for 529. Sapphire 539. Uh, and this is obviously a response to the GTX 680 launch. Now, the GTX ever show back up, which we were hoping the first week of April we'd be able to see a big um, a big shipment of them. And I guess technically Nvidia still has time to make good on that promise to us. That uh, if they stay at 499, they're still the better product in my in my mind. But now we're talking about a, you know now we're talking about thirty dollars difference, maybe twenty dollars difference as opposed to fifty, and uh, you start to reconsider. So if you're a user looking to buy a high end product or build a high end system, and there are no 680s around, 7970 is your next best option. So uh, if you're in the market for high end video cards, it is a it is a time in flux. We will say. Um, but if you need to make a purchase now, I would recommend uh, 7970s as the prices have, have have been trickling down ever so slightly. Jeremy, flying cars? Well, uh, and as much as it was a good week for tech news and picks for me, the, the PAL V is interesting. It's not quite the flying car I was looking for because, well, it's sort of an ornithopter. Uh, or not an ornithopter. Uh, what is the word I'm thinking of? Not a helicopter. Gyrocopter. It's gyrocopter. There's the one. You know, it, it's got the sort of, uh, you know, Mad Max feel to it. But at the same time, you know, I think it's... of uh, the, the Ray Bradbury miniseries ah. about the Mars stuff where the guys had the gyrocopters. They were flying around there. Yeah. yeah. But it's still not quite the flying car I'm looking for. So I'm holding out for that. What I really want this week is the tricorder. The Tricorder Mark II, because the Mark I was eh, semi-interesting. The second one, on the other hand, which has complete uh, plans on how to build it yourself, up to and including the parts list, has a ridiculous amount of sensors on it, going from GPS to uh, a non-contact IR thermometer to an RGBC sensor, atmospheric wow. temperature. It's, you know... A really, really useful tool if you can build it. And with two touch screens, it's uh, pretty much close to what you used to see. So, hey, uh, if, you can, if you've got the know-how to do this, and by that I mean basic soldering and the ability to follow instructions, it's probably about $500 for the parts, and you're going to have a halfway decent tricorder. So, seriously, if you can do it and you got the spare time, go for it and help the guy out because Mark III will probably be even better. Someone needs well, to program wait. an Elcar's interface for it. <laughs> <laughs> be awesome. Josh, what did you pick out for us this week? Me. It's a software you. pick. Uh, All right. You know, I, I, a couple of years back, I, I stumbled across it. It was the original Sins of a Solar Empire. Really good game. Kind of took over where Homeworld left off. Made it a little bit more massive in scope. Really enjoyed it. Now they have a new one coming out, uh, Sins of a Solar Empire Rebellion. Much more polished, much more interesting. It's 39 bucks, but if you have one of the previous versions, you can get like 10 bucks off and get into the beta, which I'm in. And as you know, I've, I've spent a few hours here and there <clears throat> playing it. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, for the price... It's good, and not only that, but uh, they 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 sold off Impulse, you know, Stardock sold off Impulse to GameStop or yeah or GameSpot. I can't remember GameStop, and now they're offering it on Steam. <laughs> so don't have to deal with Impulse or Origin or anything. You can open up Sweet. old good old Steam, and you've got Sins of a Solar Empire Rebellion. Cool, twenty nine dollar. If Alan, you Alan, you're last. But, so, but not uh, the last. I was going to pick something that was in stock that had to do with GTX 680s, but then I just checked the page again and it's out of stock. Um, but I was going to say that... Surprise, surprise, surprise. 
Yeah, right. Um, if you wanted to water cool a GTX 680, Coolance is now making the water blocks for it. They were making them pretty early, just a few days after they were released. Coolance had the block up and like for sale, and it's out of stock too. Um, but I will say that if you are a water cooling type or considering it, the way the GTX 680 is laid out and works, you should probably water cool this card, right? Because it takes temperature into account as part of its dynamic overclocking mm -hmm. whole thing that it does, right? So if you can keep that card cold, uh, you know, and especially considering that it doesn't really draw a whole lot of power to begin with, that should give you a whole bunch of headroom with that humongous water block on there and, you know, keep the card cool and it'll probably turn, you know, probably go like way, way faster. Like, Ryan, did you, like how hard, like percentage-wise, could you push that thing over like it's stock, whatever? Uh, it did pretty well. Um you know, so you, there was two ways to overclock, right? You adjust the power draw that it's allowed to do, and then you adjust the clock offset. I think um, in my time with it, I got it to at least its base clock speed is 1,006 megahertz. I had it up in the 1260, 1270 range um, on air cooling there. So Okay, so uh, and, would you, and would you say that it was, the, do you think it was holding back on account of temperature for that? Like, is that, I'd, you know? Actually, I don't think so. I would say uh, it still had some headroom in terms of fan speed. It definitely wasn't running at 100% fan speed. And I think that the temperatures, even when overclocked, stay kind of in the mid-80s Celsius. Um, so it might not have been heat that's holding it back. It might be, it might be uh, you know, just the chip itself. So, but now, now we've got two models. We're going to do some testing with, the over, with this Galaxy version because there is going to be variance from chip to chip now. Uh, so we'll have yep. to see how that works out. I, I'll, I'll be curious to see because I know um, EVGA is going to come out with a 680 with a water block built onto it. And maybe somebody will come out with a water block, like a self-contained water block unit like we saw PNY offer for the GTX 580 last year. And I'll be, I'll be very curious to see how the uh, GPU boost technology kind of changes with that, uh, with, that, with that type of cooling option there. And even just the aftermarket air coolers, I'm very curious to see. So hopefully soon. Uh, that, that's going to wrap up the show. If you want to get in touch with us, podcast at pcper.com is the email address. We still have a, a phone number. We did get a voicemail this week from somebody wanting me to chastise the, the Kentucky fans that rioted. Uh, I, I thought he wanted I you to change the government. Uh, well, maybe that too. I, I wasn't there, so I really couldn't do anything about it. Uh, I do think rioting for sports is stupid, but... Uh, I guess I was in college once too. One eight 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 thirty eight PC per is toll free in the U.S. and Canada. If you have any uh, comments that you want to make, regardless if it's a, uh, if it's about writing or computer technology, we're pretty we're pretty open here at uh, PC perspective. There, pcper.com slash podcast is the URL you need to give your friends, people who are interested in computer hardware and technology, learning about it, that type of stuff. Uh, spread the word about the show. Uh, we need new listeners and viewers. Uh, to 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 suffer through our hour plus long shows every week. I think that's pretty reasonable. And then of course twitter.com slash PC per Facebook.com slash PC per YouTube.com slash PC per that's about it. Oh and now you can go to PC per.com slash live uh, and you can see a schedule of upcoming events when we record this show, when we record uh, when I do Twitch with Patrick Norton on the This Week in Tech Network, which we are on right now. Um, so all kinds of things that you need to do to stay up to date with PC Perspective and all of the wonderful things that Josh, Alan, Jeremy, Scott, Tim, Matt, Lee, and everybody, everybody writes for us. So uh, thank you very much for that. I guess we'll go ahead and close out the show. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malventano. We'll talk to you next week.